Hello and welcome back to Capital Culture. Now, this is a show where we like to talk about lots of different aspects of London life. But tonight we've got a special one for you. We've got an entire episode dedicated to something we all love to complain about, really. But it's something most of us have to put up with doing every day. And that is commuting. And I'm delighted to say uh, I'm joined by three special guests. Um, we've got Amy Dicketts, founder of the extraordinary, actually, uh, Commute <laughs> blog. Uh, we've also got Sam Renke, uh, an actor and disability <laughs> rights campaigner. Um, and on the end here, we've got Maeve Keane. So she runs Future Tonic, an agency that helps companies to innovate. Um, and I'm hoping she might have a few tips for us on how we can commute better in the future. So guys, thank you so much for joining me. I want to start really by talking to you about what your commute is like. But I should say as well, if you're watching at home, we want to hear from you. What's your commute like? How long does it take? Have you got any pet hates on the tube? Leave your messages on Facebook. I've got an iPad here. I will try to read as many of them out as possible. Um, so Amy, let's start with you. How do you commute? How do you get to work? Um, I have the joy of getting on the Waterloo and City line every day, which is the immediate way to suck all of the yeah, fun out of your <laughs> day. So, um, yeah, that's it pretty much going straight into the heart of the city. But um, I'm trying to mix it up with cycling a bit now, okay. which just means getting overtaken by a lot of men in Lycra. Uh, <laughs> so one, nice. one tube, that's the... Yeah, yeah, okay. a train and a tube. A train, so, a train and a tube. Train can, and anyone, tube. can anyone better that? Has anyone got any advances on that? Well, better or worse? Worse. Yeah. <laughs> worse. No, no, no. Mine, mine is, mine's better than that. I've just okay. got one train, 10-minute um, overground um, from Hackney Downs to Liverpool Street and then a short walk. Okay. Or cycling. I'm also trying to yeah. cycle. Um, probably do it about two or three times a week, it's depending tough. on the weather. Yeah, yeah. And is so. cycling less stressful? More stressful, different, different stressful. right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Overall, I'd say it's probably less stressful because you're in complete mm. control of what you do and and how fast you go. Mm. And um, but obviously, the stress is not knowing what other people are going to do mm. and people pulling out. And other cyclists are actually yeah. more stressful than than um, cars and buses. I'd say. I don't know if you find the same thing. Totally. Yeah. They seem to. I don't know, I think they're on the Tour de France, some of them. So yeah. uh, I just let them go ahead, chill out at the back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then it's a bit scary. Just... I've always been a little bit scared um, to cycle in London. It can be, yeah. But I think it's not a reason not to do it. OK. It. Yeah. OK, Sam, what about you? Do you have a regular commute? Or? Well, I do. So I always say that some people are born to drive and some people are born to be driven. And I'm definitely <laughs> falling into that latter. So I am a massive advocate of black cabs, mm. pure and simply because of accessibility needs. And obviously, every single black cab in, in London um, has to have wheelchair access. So for me, I moved to London seven years ago, kind of cut them ties with the, the mother who used to be my private taxi driver. Um, and, you know, I moved to London and all of a sudden I thought, goodness me, how am I going to get around? And for the magic of technology and all these lovely little apps that we have, I can get door-to-door -door service with a, a, a cab that has all the access and I can go from, you know, wherever I want. With, with security and I don't really lose my independence. Yeah, yeah. Do you use the tube much at all? I avoid it mm. for a few reasons. Only I think 16 stations are accessible. And also I have a condition called brutal bones, so I fracture my bones quite easily. So I must admit, if I've ever used a, a, a underground, I have been with a, a number of friends and it's been at non-rush hour times. I think it would be a little bit um, kind of dangerous for me to go in rush hour. So um, again, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a princess so I like my, I like the comfort of uh, you know my leather upholstery so yeah, don't blame me <laughs> um, what about you guys is there anything that you is there anything that particularly annoys you about commuting I'm thinking on the tube I suppose for starters um, I think people constantly being on their phones or staring yeah. at their phones. Yeah, um, yeah having no mm. idea where they're going is, is kind of a struggle because you're mm. weaving. Navigating. Them. Mm. Yeah. Difficult for me. The amount of people that kind of nearly fall on top of me, and obviously if you've got a visual impairment, that can be really quite dangerous. I've often said, I could be over like a cattle prod, just if anyone mm. walks into me. don't know how legal that would be, but it would uh, solve a lot of the problems. But on a serious note, you know, I think people not engaging and not knowing their environment and just being in their own little 
little bubble and wanting to get from A to B without considering other people. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, it's getting more and more like that, particularly in London, you know, such a bustling city. Yeah, yeah well, something I was going to come to later, actually, mm. but since you mention it, the priority seat, do people notice that's there? Do they realise they're <laughs> sitting in it? Do they in pretend I... they haven't realised they're sitting yeah. in it? I... So, um, being pregnant yeah. in the tube mm. was... Uh, because it's it was actually before you start looking obviously pregnant, at least mm, with course. me, that you need the seat most because you're feeling sick and exhausted, and but obviously in the latter stages as well. Um, I was generally quite pleasantly surprised with how many people mm. stood up. Um, you wear a badge, one of the badges. I did you know, wear a badge, yeah. but like you know, when you change coats or yeah, of course. you know, you just forget it, and sometimes. Um, but also, I just think if you politely ask, and I got a bit more confident at doing yeah. that at first, even though I kind of needed the seat the most mm. in those sort of early stages, you yeah. sort of feel like, oh, I don't look pregnant, and like, why should, why do I deserve a seat more than someone else? Yeah. yeah. But then I think as I got more pregnant, I was like, actually, I mean, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the same thing for people who have invisible disabilities. Mm. Obviously, there's around like 14 million disabled people in the UK, and you know, about eight percent are wheelchair users. So actually, a large proportion have invisible disability and I think they find that they've got to get judged if they ask mm. someone to maybe give up that space because yeah. they'll be like, well, you don't, you don't look disabled, yeah. whatever that means, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it can be quite yeah. traumatic. I mean, I've experienced, you know, people kind of huffing and puffing a little bit that they've had to move out of the way or, you know, particularly in rush hour yeah. times, mm. which is really quite, makes me feel like a burden mm. sometimes. Mm. So actually people aren't always that magnanimous about it. No, and no. It's, if it's rush hour, then they're less likely to be considerate. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That's but I do think sometimes the, the, if there's other people around kind of shaming that, I yeah. think sometimes yeah. people yeah. feel obliged because, because I have been in, I've actually, um, when someone's been heavily pregnant, sort of stepped in to say, can you give, like, yeah. put someone pretending they hadn't seen, maybe they hadn't mm -hmm. seen, right? Mm -hmm. But um, the woman didn't feel able to. And so I think people are a bit more mm -hmm. willing to kind of step in and say, oh, this person really needs yeah. a seat yeah. um, than they were before, maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, people do like go into their own worlds and yeah, being on your phone or being asleep, people pretending to be asleep. Oh, really? I've well, not heard that one before. <laughs> maybe they are funny. asleep, maybe they are. <laughs> like, yeah. But if you're gonna sit in a priority seat and sit there with your eyes closed, like maybe um, if you're gonna sit there, I think you should try yeah, and be aware fun. of like yeah. Yeah. people getting on that need to sit in mm. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I was, generally quite pleasantly surprised yeah. but obviously there nice are exceptions yeah. yeah yeah and what about more i mean more generally i'm assuming you're gonna you're gonna laugh in my face when i ask this but do you can you ever get a seat in when it's rush hour if you time it... it right yeah i don't know okay, but okay. then sometimes i think if you're gonna sit down in your office all day yeah if you don't need the seat is it you know sometimes it doesn't matter to stand up anyway so, so, yeah and you, you think about, maybe Actually, the power of giving someone else a seat, if you can see you're both going for it and letting them go for it, kind yeah. of makes their day. And then you're like, oh, OK, I'll give yeah. it away. Yeah. And all that yeah. bit of kindness. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think people at the tube are generally not that bad. I mean, rush hour, obviously, you're catching them at the worst time. It's either they're going to work and they're knackered or they're leaving work and they're knackered. Mm. So, yeah, it not on their best funny, behaviour, but yeah. I think people try. On, yeah. on the tube, when it's that packed, looking around, and, you know, all human life is there. And you mm. see people doing all sorts mm. of things. Yeah. I don't know, how do, you people, how do you guys feel about seeing people doing their makeup on the I bus, do it all on the, the time. tube. I do it all the time. I do it all <laughs> the time. It's because I'm not organised enough yes, to get it yeah. on my face. Yeah. But I know some people have a real problem I know some it. people like, have a... Do that at home. And I've had, like, glares and stares. No one's ever said anything to me. Um, but... It's, yeah, it's, it's just, I'm a London, I was born in London, <laughs> I've been doing the, my makeup on the tube since I was a, you know, teenage. I just, How safe like, is that? I just think if you could do in your eyeliner. Oh, it's it worries a real me that you know. Yeah. Yeah. But there's ways of steadying your hands on. Oh, really? Yeah. There's an art yeah. form. It's just like yeah. an art form. Yeah. Around. <laughs> you get used to it. Yeah. What about people eating on the bus, on the tube? Um, as long as it's not cheese and onion crisps. So it's the smell. It's the yeah, smell. Yeah, I think it's yeah. the smell. And you I, get a lot of people yeah. eating takeaways on, on yeah. the bus, you know. Well, everyone's done a, everyone does a cheeky chi chicken cottage, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> if it's 1am. I was going to say at 1am. Yeah. 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 kebab. Yeah. I'm not the first to judge on that one. So. Yeah, I think eating, yeah. people need to eat and need to eat. Um, yeah, exactly. But... Life's hard enough without, you know, judging people for that. As long as you take yeah. the rubbish yeah. with yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah.
That's yeah. Take your rubbish. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to take your rubbish with exactly. you. Yeah, that, that's that's fair enough. But like you say, life's so busy in London, you sort of got to get things done on the move. Yeah. You? So, yeah, 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 yeah it makes sense. Well, now, Amy, I'm interested in talking to you because you found yeah. a very novel way to pass time yes. on the tube. You set up commute blog so blog, tell yeah. me tell us a bit more about that um yeah so when i first left uni and i moved back home with my mum in the kind of deepest suburbs of north london and i was traveling loads on the train and on the tubes going to see friends going to work um and i just had this idea one day of um picking up my camera and starting to try and find some interesting stories from the people around me yeah um so i would ask people if i could take their photo and if they could tell me something surprising about themselves okay. um and then start to gather all of the stories of London. And what sort of, actually, before I ask you, I think we can mm. see it. Yeah, we can see a photo here. Oh, yeah. So tell us what's the story behind this one. Um, so this guy uh, defines himself as a punk and he says he sort of grew up in the punk era and he was actually gay and couldn't really come out, wasn't in that sort of community where that was acceptable. So instead he expressed himself through his clothes, which I just absolutely loved. And he was like, nothing I'm wearing costs more than £10. Love so, it. Wow. Yeah. So cool. do you still find you can remember they're all kind of imprinted yeah, on, yeah, your, you, on your you mind? Yeah, you do. They sort of, yeah, they, you, they become quite familiar. It was like... Yeah. And what we must look at a couple more in a minute, yeah. but what, what responses did you did you get from people? Because some people must have looked at you as if you were mad. <laughs> some people looked at me as if I was mad. I think it's more the idea of anyone speaking on the tube is the mad thing. Um, but most people are actually really friendly. I think uh, this is the point. It's obviously you sometimes catch people on terrible days, um, but mostly people are really friendly. Mm -hmm. They want to have a chat. They're, they're interested mm. in the project. They're um, keen to share their story. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's the opposite of what you would expect, I think. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is really kind of reassuring. Yeah. Um, we've got another one here. Can you tell us about this? Oh, yes. This woman? So, this was, um, so through the project, I was lucky enough to um, meet up with a charity called South London Cares, mm. and they connect older people in London neighbourhoods with their um, younger neighbours. Nice. And okay. it's kind of like, uh, bringing the two generations together and what they can learn from each other. So kind of a great link with Commute Blog and what I try and do. Yeah. Um, and so she was in her 90s and she was telling me all about her time um, during the war. And um, she had to take over the postal round from the postman who had gone to war. And she had to take a horse and cart around the streets of London. Wow. And she didn't know where any of the stops were, but the horse just knew uh, where to stop. <laughs> and then she would deliver the post. So That's absolutely yeah, incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. That. All the stories that people kind of have inside them and, and don't necessarily get a chance to share. Yeah, that's what I try and shine a light on. And how long was how long did you tend to spend with each person? Could it sometimes be just a few minutes and sometimes much longer? Yeah, I think that's the interesting thing about photography on the tube is you don't get to choose your lighting, you don't get to choose your depth of field, you don't get to choose yeah. your subjects or how long you have with them. So some of them might be getting off in two stops, some of them you might have longer with. Yeah, um, yeah. But it could be just a minute, it could be uh, five, ten minutes, but usually not very long. You don't want to... The whole point is not that everyone should speak to each other on the tube, that's not kind of the aim but it's like if you kind of look up what interesting stories can you find from the people around you or is there a bit more wonder in the world that you can discover so mm. I didn't want to kind of have a really long long chats with people and yeah. ruin their whole journeys but it's just <laughs> I'm uh, sure you weren't yeah. ruining their journeys <laughs> you know I'm sure some of them were reading good books uh, that I was interrupting but it was just to have that moment of connection and find out something um, unexpected about the people around us yeah I think making human connections mm. is probably not something a lot of us find no. we do or not particularly no. often yeah. and, and we kind of hear about you know loneliness is, is really mm. affecting so many people particularly the elderly you know members of our society and I mm. think it's so beautiful that we take time out to have that interaction but I I have that interaction with cab drivers yeah. and yeah. I get such interesting stories yeah. and I get free tours of London yeah. and they'll proudly tell me about the history of London. Yeah. I'm like, should I be paying you more for this? Because <laughs> this is so interesting. And yeah. it's nice, particularly, obviously, I work a lot in television things and I run through what I'm going to say on television yeah. with all the cab drivers, God bless them, whether they want to hear it or not, yeah. they get to hear my stories. And I think that's just so so lovely you know just having that like you said it might be one minute it might be 10 minutes but having that interaction mm. yeah. is and telling is stories great. is such an innately human thing mm. to do mm. it's yeah. how we have connected with each other and taught each other different things and learned how not to do things and and innovated it's how things have changed and got better yeah. over over millennia so exactly and it's that interesting thing about being on social media and that Social media is a great way to connect people, but it's also uh, 
it kind of separates people mm. in a way or keeps people in their bubble. So I hope by telling these stories, it helps people to hear stories of people that they might not otherwise speak to or paths that they might not otherwise cross. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's really interesting. Right, we've got a couple of people have commented <laughs> here on things that drive them mad on the tube. We've got people talking on their mobile phones mm. um, loudly. I mean, probably that doesn't happen on the tube, yeah. but obviously on trains and platforms and things. People with huge rucksacks. Mm. On oh, yes. I was say rucksacks. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They, I think me. Put, take your rucksack off and make space for people. Like, yeah. just put it in between your legs on the floor. But Yeah. Again, it's that thing of being mindful of other people. Yeah, awareness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just kind of looking up and realising who's around you and what impact you're having on other people is super important. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's really interesting to hear some of your stories. I wanted to um, ask you, Maeve, whether you mm. think that feeling like you're, because I know you've written about this, feeling like you're doing something productive is mm. sort of the key to a successful commute in a way. Yeah, I think trying to feel like you're not, you're, you're in that transition point, yeah. right? You're not... You're not at home or work, you're sort of in between. And there's so many variables that you're out of control that aren't mm -hmm. in your control. And so the thing that you can control, what you do, what you listen to, what you read, what you write, who you talk to, um, mm. if, you're, if there's an environment that allows you to do that in a productive way, allows you to read your book, um, to do that piece of work, to listen to that podcast or whatever, I think, that can really help you to feel like you've not completely wasted the time yeah. um, and that you've actually used it to further yourself in some way. Um, yeah. Even if it's, you know, switching off meditation, breathing, you know, it, it doesn't have to be work related. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. but, but somehow taking that time that is, if you don't do something with it, it will be wasted, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But increasingly, you know, you look around and see so many people on their phones. Mm. Um, quite often, I just like to stare into space and just like wonder and <laughs> let my, you know, because I think there's so few times in well, life these days. Well, that's mindful, isn't it? Yeah, that's, mindful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Being, being, trying to be present in at least what's going on in your head at that yeah. time or something. Yeah, because yeah, well, the ONS reported last year on this and they said that long and stressful commutes are detrimental to our general well-being. Mm. I mean, is that is, is commuting bad for our mental health? Is that something you all recognise? I think definitely. I think, I think it, it raises can be. blood pressure. Yeah, it depends yeah. on how you approach it, though. Yeah. It's what you're allowed to stress. You obviously, train delays are super stressful when you've got family at home you want to get back to. But generally, just the fact that you have to commute shouldn't instantly put you in a bad mood. I think it is finding those ways to make it a useful time. I think that's why podcasts have become mm. so popular. Mm. Or just putting yourself in a space where you think, well, I'm going to get to work. You know, I'm not going to yeah. be stranded here forever. So I don't know. I think life is sometimes as stressful as you make it. Podcasts are a good mm. one. Yeah. The ONS also said last year that the number of women travelling for more than an hour to work in London specifically has increased by almost half since 2011. Mm. You're nodding. Why is well, that? Well, I think people... Housing has become more of an issue. Yeah. And so people have had to move further away from their places of work to find more somewhere affordable. they can afford yeah. to live. Yeah. And so that is increasing the time um, that people have to spend... Um, there's this term extreme commuting, yes. which depending on yes. who you look at means something, means either between 90 minutes and two hours each way. Wow. So that is a lot of time. Yeah. And Londoners, um, as I'm sure you guys won't be surprised to hear, we commute long, our commute are the longest from out of the whole country. So yeah. um, people, because house, house prices are so inflated in London and there is such a shortage of affordable housing, yeah. yet there's so many job opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. So people are sort of flocking here for job opportunities, but having to live outside um, to, to mm. commute in. So, so what's the future? Is that a question? I yeah, can it's getting like. better. You'll be pleased to. Is there hear. hope? There's hope. <laughs> um, I think with flexible working and people working from home more, yeah. um, more pe the pe the number of people that are having to commute every day is going to go down. Mm. So people are going to be com even if they're doing a full time job, they're going to be commuting three or four days a week. Um, and that kind of as long as you can have somewhere productive to work, whether it's at home or a local coffee okay. shop or a cafe yeah, or, or a library or something that kind of benefits everyone. Right. It alleviates the number of people on the system. It often helps your employer. Offices. Offices. Is that yeah. right? So that's a coffee shop oh. slash office. That's right. Slash yeah. office. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. I often work from a coffee. Do uh, you? Local right. To me. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think I think yeah. So so spaces like coffee shops 
um, lobbies of hotels, yeah. members only clubs have adapted to kind of suit the needs of an increasing mobile workforce. Yeah. Um, more and more people are becoming freelance and by 2030, over 50% of people are gonna be freelance or independent workers. Mm. Um, and great. yeah, yeah, there's, there's, a real, there's a real positivity to that. But I think yeah. that throws up loads of challenges about if people are working freelance and they're not part of a team every day yeah. then how do you provide people that social interaction yes yeah um, and so I think that's where things like coffices come in because mm -hmm. you can be working you know you can do a good sort of three four hours concentrated work in the morning and if you can come together with people and have a mm -hmm. kind of 45 minute hour lunch where you're exchanging and um having chats over yeah, lunch with yeah. people, that could be. So I think we might see something interesting happen with lunchtime. I think lunchtime in this country, we, ha we don't really have a lunch culture. Um, lots of European countries do where they take off yeah, two yeah. hours. You know, <laughs> yeah. Some parts of Europe even have a big siesta after lunch. Yeah. We never have, it's always been a sandwich at the desk. Yeah, and I yeah. think um, as more and more people become freelancers and more and more people are working from home, even if they're not freelancing, um, People, there's going to hopefully be a kind of reclaiming of lunch and having that as a kind of a social opportunity and a break from your desk. Yeah. So yeah. maybe people will be working from home but going to kind of lunch hubs in their local areas, whether it's someone else's house or whether mm. it's a coffee shop. Okay. Um, and I think there's that's really healthy. That's, yeah. a, that's a really healthy Sounds culture. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring back the siesta. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Thinking about the We're wine, me, really. <laughs> Bring out the wine. So, so, <laughs> talking there about sort of the future of yeah fighting. but do you feel that things are really keeping up now because you know just going back to, to tube mm. and train travel tfl say a quarter of tube stations half of overground stations and all their dlr stations are have step free access is that good enough really is not really i think you need training of staff that's the main thing as well you need mm -hmm. to make sure that staff are there on time you know if i were to get on a train if i booked assistance i'd have to pre-book 24 hours in advance really? and it's you know feeding into this stereotype that people with disabilities don't have spontaneous places to be we don't have to go to a meeting quickly we have to wait for you know kind of a ramp to be put out which is yeah. a basic need i think we live in a world where technology is so rich yet i go to places where you know they, they, they've not even got so for example the new electric vehicles yeah. you know it's like um, they've only got a ramp on one side why don't you put a ramp on both sides I live in a street that's one way so I actually have to get someone to help me every time I get to, to, to go anywhere to get me across the street so I think Everything at the moment, we, we are leaving out people with disabilities when we're looking at new technology. We need to actually be asking people like me, you know, like, what do you need? Come on and, and help us uh, to, to see the future. I think the main concern for me now is I moved to London to be more independent. Yeah. First few years were great, and now I'm slowly losing my independence, purely because of pedestrianisation, ro roads, yeah. you know, um, cabs, which are, again, by law, all have to be accessible, now can't go down certain certain roads um, because of the, the, the restrictions. Um, so, you know, I, I do work a lot with, with, with taxis because they are a lifeline. You know, a lot of people with disabilities can feel so isolated mm. and it's the safest um, way to commute is by, by cabs, you know. And so there's a lot of fear from the disabled community. Because don't forget, they have training. They have training, you know, intensive training to, to deal with people who to, to help them safely get from A to B. Yeah. And if you can't go down a road because of restrictions, cabs can't go down a road, what, what do you do? Or if it's pedestrianised, you just dump someone with a wheelchair by the side yeah, of the road and go, oh, well, what are we going to do? I think, you know, the Mayor of London really needs to kind of look at... Look, I, I am all for environmental... You know, I think people think that I, I don't want the universe, you know, the pollution to get better. It's not about that, but you can't kind of restrict a whole, a whole you know, part of London mm. without actually thinking about people that actually need to use that. You know, you can't just take it away yeah. and go, well, we don't really care about you, but we do care about the environment. I care about the environment, but I also need to get to work. Yeah. I also need to socialise. I, you know, talk about mental health issues. If I don't get out, like we were saying, people don't socialise, you know, kind of that increases anxiety, depression. Yeah. So it's it, we need to kind of come together. Yeah. We need to involve the disabled community a lot more in the way of, of, of making London a more accessible place 
for, yeah. for everybody. Mm. Yeah, it's and that's not happening at the moment, unfortunately. I'm sure, you know, I'm sure TfL would point to lots of examples of where mm. they are making really positive changes and, you know, step-free access from um, platforms onto trains, for example. And, and, and I'm sure that, that they would point to lots of examples and say that they're making progress. But you're, you would invite them to talk to you. Yeah, Is definitely. You need about to, you know, uh, what else yes. they could do? I it's mean, not just it's not just it's not stations just and, stations. And trains. Yeah. It's, not just, it's about just a knowledge of, of, of what it's like to have a disability, whether that's yeah. visible or invisible, mm. you know, because it just going your daily, day, you know, kind of activities can be extremely stressful yeah. when you have a disability. And that's just a simple fact. And yeah. unfortunately, you know, things seem to be getting worse before they're getting better. Interesting. Mm. So you said you moved to London for more independence. Mm. Would commuting ever make you think about leaving London? Um, I still love London. I, I've, I've adopted it as my home, but I'm not going to lie. It's made me quite sad. Past the past two years, I've seen a, a you know it, it change for the for the worse. Mm. Um, I feel like I've kind of been you know not treated like everyone else, like left out of the loop of this beautiful change, and that's quite sad. Um, and it's scary because people you know people becoming housebound mm. purely because of of an, an, an inaccessible forms of transport, mm. and also. Attitude, attitudes, mm. unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. Um, because you know it's a, it's it's sad. And again, TFL, if you want to come and chat to me and uh, um, get me on board, I can get a lot of people to come and yeah. help you. you. We need to be working together okay. instead of excluding people. Yeah. Okay. And would commuting ever make either of you guys think about leaving London? You know, people always say it's the old cliche, isn't it? I just couldn't cope with my commute anymore. I had yeah. to leave. But no, I, no. I think it's just it's not that bad. No, it's just a fact of life. And I'm really lucky. I work for a startup, and actually, as you were saying about um, working remote, like two of my team members, one works, one lives in Glasgow, and one lives in Wales, and they just um, dial in. So I definitely have flexibility of working from home. I mm. think that's going to expand more as we kind of move towards more digital age. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind. I, I don't mind it. It's not, you know. It's not the worst thing, and I'm getting better <laughs> at my cycling as well. So, yeah, 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 I think it's just about mixing it up and yeah. thinking about what you can do to keep it interesting, um, whether that's kind yeah. of chatting to people. And it, and it will get better yeah. as we have more data, real-time data, about where the crunches in the system are, yeah. which which coaches on the tube or the train you yeah. shouldn't get on or you should avoid. And even if... Um, if TfL and other transport operators start thinking about incentivising people mm. to travel at times when there's excess space, mm. right? Yeah. So that we can be smarter mm. about how yeah. we spread people out across, because if people can work flexibly, then maybe, you know, start a ten. whole swathe yeah. of society could start going to work at seven o'clock and leaving it, I don't know. Yeah. And, and, and if there's some sort of incentivization around that so that the system can cope better yeah um but actually numbers of people using the tube for the first time is declining yeah um for the first time yeah i was reading ever yeah. like um, yeah. in the last couple of years is declining mm. um and i think that is got to do with remote working people working from home yeah flexible working there's, there's probably loads of other factors mm. but i think um yeah, trying okay. to trying to be smarter about how we use data, big data and real time data mm. to um, inform people about when the best times to mm. travel are, mm. what the best accessible, accessible routes reason. are. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Lots to think about. Guys, that's all we've got time for. I could talk to you all, all <laughs> evening, but thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. About this. Thank you for watching. Uh, we'll be back next month with an episode all about London's live music scene. Uh, but until then, bye bye.